morning we're going to be looking at the duties of the pastor to the congregation. We're going to be opening up to 1 Peter chapter 5. Before we do that, let me, let me maybe spur some thoughts on for you. I think for those of you, even if you don't have a spouse, even if you don't have children, if someone were to come to you and say, okay, wh where would you go look in the scripture to be able to see the, the duties of a husband to a wife, a wife to a husband, parents to children, children to parents? I think all of you would probably have an idea of where you might turn. You might probably go to Ephesians chapter 5 or 6, maybe Colossians chapter 3, where you'd see wives submit to your husband your own husbands as to the Lord husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her children obey your parents in the Lord for this is right fathers do not provoke your children to anger but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord but let me ask you this what if someone were to come to you and ask you about the duties that we as pastors have to you as members of the congregation or the duties that you as members of the congregation have to us as pastors where would you go then would your thoughts be mainly based upon your experience your tradition maybe churches you've been at in the past maybe um, how jesse and i have have pastored you is there any text that you would specifically be able to turn to if someone were to ask you that could you take them to god's word and could you show them if you couldn't do that, would you at least have an idea how to biblically explain to them what are these duties that exist between the pastor and the congregation? If you can't do that, how can you be sure that you are fulfilling your responsibilities, your duties to us, your pastors, and how can you be sure that we as your pastors are fulfilling those responsibilities and those duties to you? Brothers and sisters, it's critical that all of us understand what the Scripture teaches in these areas. Often, though, this is something that I can say even, even today, this is a, these are difficult things to preach on, to preach on the pastor's duty to the congregation. These things can be misunderstood. These things are hard and intimidating, humbling. Even this week studying these things, just the weightiness. I, I, can, I can say there, there's, there's something in me that makes me not want to teach upon these things. And then... Next, we're going to look at the duties of the congregation to the pastors. Well, certainly there, there's, there's a chance for misunderstanding. There's a chance for people to think, wow, th th these men are trying to lord it over us. These men are trying to be self-serving in teaching these things. And in a sense, it is self-serving for pastors to teach these things, but, but it's right. And as pastors, that's something we're committed to, is to teach the whole counsel of God, even when it's not popular, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it's going to be difficult, maybe, for people to hear those things. But God's Word speaks directly to these responsibilities and it implies others elsewhere. And so, pastorally, we have a responsibility to stand up and preach and teach these things. Brothers and sisters, we teach the whole counsel of God, even when it's not popular, even when it's something that may be difficult for people to hear. So today, we're going to be looking at the first side of this, the duties of pastors to the congregation. And next week, Lord willing, we're going to flip it around and look at the responsibilities, the duties of you, the congregation, to us as pastors. Let's begin with reading 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Hear the word of the Lord. 
So I exhort the elders among you, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful, shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So thus far in God's holy, inerrant, and inspired word, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just come to you asking for your help in these things today. Lord, even now I just feel the weightiness of this text, the weightiness of the calling upon us as pastors. Lord, help my words to be clear today. Help me to rightly divide your word. Just grant us all understanding. Help us to see where maybe we've let our tradition, our experience guide our thinking in these things rather than your word. And Lord, give us the grace to renew our minds, to correct those thoughts and conformity with your word. And Lord, in all this, may you be given all the glory. And it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. So here on the screen, and the, the screens on the side you can see are not working, so if you want to scoot in, there's actually two rows here in front. If anybody's having a, a problem seeing, you're welcome to come and scoot in there. But what you'll see there in... What I have underlined is really where I want to start. I want to start with really a basic understanding of who this text is speaking to because there's much misunderstanding even within the, the, the evangelical church globally on who is a pastor, who is an elder, what, what do these roles mean? And what you see there, this text is addressed where Peter says, I exhort the elders among you. The word there for elders is presbyteros. And maybe that sounds a little familiar to you, that it would be the Greek word where the Presbyterian church gets its name from. Notice something here that it's elders plural. So it's, it's plural elders within the churches that are being exhorted here. And so we should see that a local church is to have a plurality of godly elders. And also notice here that these elders, they're among the church. These are not elders in some far off place. These are not elders that are separated from the congregation. This is not a, a pastor up on a screen. This is not a, a group of men ruling from a denominational headquarters somewhere off in the distance. These men are members of the church. These are men that have been particularly gifted by God to serve in this office, but they are members among the congregation. In the exhortation that he gives to the elders, he says, Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. So the word there translated shepherd. It's the word that in the Latin that the word pastor comes from. So he's saying elders, pastor this flock of God that is among you there. We see the noun form of this word is used in Ephesians chapter 4 in verse 11 where there Paul exhorts the church at Ephesus. He says he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds is how the ESV renders that. The King James and the NASB say pastors there. So we're talking about elders, pastors. Then he says, as a part of the shepherding, you're to exercise oversight. And there the Greek word is episkopeo. That may be a word that, that has a familiarity with you as well. This is where the Episcopal Church derives its name from, from this Greek word. And there we're, we're talking about a word that's translated bishop or overseer. In certain translations, the noun form of this word is used in 1 Timothy chapter 3, where Paul is exhorting Timothy with the qualifications 
for the elder. He says, the saying is trustworthy if anyone aspires to the office of overseer. And in King, the King James translates that bishop, he desires a noble task. And so what are we to take away from that? And I think this is, this is a very important foundational understanding that we need to have, whether we're talking about the word pastor, elder, overseer, bishop, shepherd. These are all names used to describe a singular office within the local church. These are not some sort of hierarchy that you see in certain churches and even certain cults take these names and apply some sort of unbiblical hierarchical structure to them. But what we see in Scripture is that there's two offices within the local church. There's the pastor or the shepherd, and there's the deacon, which is it's the transliteration of the Greek word for servant. So this is the nature of the leadership within the local church are shepherds and servants. So let that thinking frame all of this as we talk about what church leadership looks like. And I think that those words actually help us. They give us a more full-orbed understanding of what this calling is as pastors and elders. And that's typically the words that we would use here at Grace Life. We would refer to, to Jesse and I would refer to ourselves as pastors or elders here within the flock rather than using the terms bishop or overseer. But these are in scripture identical and synonymous terms. So as we think about the idea of shepherding, we, we see this used a lot in Scripture, and I think it's a very helpful way to think about the calling of the pastor. And it's not something that's just unique to Paul or unique even to the New Testament. What we see is that there's a theme throughout Scripture of God being described as the shepherd of his people, as well as human beings that are leaders of his people being also described as shepherds. In Psalm 23, verse 1, David says, Yahweh is my shepherd. I shall not want. And in 2 Samuel 5, 1 and 2, the word says, Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Behold, we are your bone and flesh. In times past, when Saul was king over you, it was you who led out and brought in Israel. And Yahweh said to you, You shall be shepherd of my people Israel, and you shall be prince over Israel. So that's just one of the examples we could point to many of leaders in the Old Testament being described as shepherds. And as we talk often about about this, this flow of redemptive history all pointing to one place, we see even in our text today that there is only one chief shepherd that all these earthly shepherds in the rest of Scripture point to, and that is Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4, is when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. And so that needs to frame our thoughts about this, this calling as pastors or shepherds. There's one chief shepherd, and as pastors, we are called as under shepherds underneath this one chief shepherd that we are accountable to. What I want to look at today within this text in 1 Peter is really four duties, four responsibilities of us as pastors to you, the congregation. And that is our responsibility to know you, to know the sheep. And secondly, it's our responsibility, our duty to feed you, to feed the sheep. We're also responsible to lead the sheep and protect the sheep. And so that, that's the outline of where we're going to go today is just to, to open up this text and look at these callings individually within this text in 1 Peter. Our focus today is really going to be upon verse 2, which is where we're going to begin. So here Peter says, Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. So remember, who is this exhortation to? The exhortation is to the elders. The elders are called the shepherd, our pastor, this flock of God that is among them. 
But that brings us to a question, who is this flock? Who is it that we are to shepherd? Who are the sheep that we're called specifically to shepherd? Well, in the big picture sense, we could go to John chapter 10, in verse 27 and 28, where there Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. And so we could have this big picture perspective of the universal church being the sheep that have been effectually called, that have put their faith in Christ, repented and believed. They've responded in faith to the gospel call. And we see in this text, this is something that we've touched on as Jesse's gone through John chapter 6, that you don't become a sheep by believing, you believe because you are a sheep. So we have to keep that right order in mind, even in this. We have to recognize that it's God who chooses, God who calls, God who regenerates, and God who gets all the glory. So soli deo gloria. So we have this group, this universal church. Now, who is it within this universal church that Jesse and I as pastors are called to shepherd? Do we go around the neighborhood around us, go knock upon doors and find out, you know, hey, do you profess Christ? Okay, you're a sheep. Let me shepherd you. Let me introduce you. If someone comes and visits the church on a particular Sunday, does that make them one of the sheep that we're called to shepherd? As you think about that, let me give you a text that adds an immense amount of urgency to how you think through that. You know, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So here you see... The shepherds, the pastors, are soul watchers. They're accountable for the sheep that are under their care. And so I hope you see just the, the immensity, the urgency that that brings to this, what may seem like sort of a theoretical question of, okay, who are these sheep that we're to pastor? I hope you see this great ability, this great need for the pastors to know who are those sheep, who are those sheep that you will give an account of before God. And then, as you think about it, as, for you as church members, doesn't it follow that you need to know which pastors it are that you're accountable to obey and submit to? Are you called to an obey and submit to the pastor at the church down the street? The pastor of the Methodist church or the Bible church that may live in your neighborhood? Are you called to submit to them? What about our brother Nathaniel who was here a few years ago? Is he called to submit to Jesse and I still as elders? Called to obey us? How do we determine that? I think what we can see is that these things clearly imply the identification with individual Christian believers to a specific local church with specific elders. We see that same implication in Matthew chapter 18. I think you're probably all familiar with that. It's just the, the text dealing with church discipline. And as we get to the end of that process, what's the call? To tell it to who? Tell it to the church. So who are we to tell it to? Are we to tell it to the universal church? Do we go take out an ad in the newspaper? Do we start posting online? Here's this brother in sin. Or do we choose some local church at random, come with our little pile of papers to pass them out, you know, put this brother or sister's picture on it and, and identify their sin? No, clearly these texts imply identification with a specific local church by individual Christians with specific pastoral leadership that are responsible for their souls. 
And pastorally, we believe that is the call for every Christian. We choose the term church membership of what this identification looks like, but we're not held to that name. But what we're saying is that every individual Christian should identify with a local church covenanting there with the members, putting themselves under the submission and authority of those specific local elders. And I think that's especially timely. Lord willing, in January, we're going to start a new member class. And so for those of you that are not members that would consider that, this is, I think, a timely message in that regard to think through these things, think through how Jesse and I see our duty to you pastorally, and next week, your duty to us as pastors. Now, a very important question arises, well, whose flock is this? This is God's flock. This is not the pastor's flock. This is not Phil's church. This is not Jesse's church. This is not any man's church. This is the church of God. This is the bride of Christ. As I pointed out earlier, there's one chief shepherd. This is his church, his body. We are under shepherds, under his authority, guided by his word. For those of you that are parents, it's easy to think in terms of the parent-child relationship here. There's, there's much similarity in the calling of parents and the calling of pastors. And as you, I think you can think and meditate upon that and begin to get a greater understanding of what our calling is. As I've mentioned already, Peter says, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Again, these are not leaders, these pastors, often some far off place, not ruling and making decisions from afar. These are also church members who have been particularly gifted and called to the office of pastor. I hope you can see the urgency there of us knowing, being able to identify who it is these sheep are that we're accountable to. But I also hope you can begin to see that this call to know goes so much beyond, you know, just being able to you know, number people off. We see in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, this is part of Paul's exhortation to the Ephesian elders. I think we can get a better sense of what this knowing entails there. He tells them to pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. So just two things there within that text. It says, pay careful attention to. So this is to be on guard, to give heed, to apply, to apply your mind to this flock that is among you that you've been entrusted with, pastors. And notice it says, all the flock. It's the, the entire flock, every single individual member we are called pastorally to pay careful attention to. One of the things practically that Jesse and I have done to, to help us in that is we've taken the number of member households, which is a little over 50 at this point, and divided that amongst ourselves so that each one of us is assigned as basically what would be the primary shepherding elder of each household. That way we, by God's grace, can be sure that no one falls through the cracks here with us as shepherds. And our desire would actually to be within every one of your homes very regularly. And the reality just in God's providence with over 50 homes and two pastors, you can see how that math it becomes crunched very quickly of the practical outworking of that. And hopefully as you see what we're called to as pastors and recognize that reality, it will spur you even onto more prayer for the Lord to raise up more faithful men in these things to come alongside us and to shepherd you. As a part of this, we also have a responsibility to pray. To pray for the flock, not just global prayers, but to pray for you individually. 
So Jesse and I, every week, divide up the church and are, and are praying for each member here, each person here within the congregation. And so as a part of those prayers, we don't want them to be just general prayers that you could pray for anybody, but we want to know the, the trials, the struggles, the circumstances within people's lives to be able to specifically pray to God related to those things. And so for you, if there's things that you want us, need us to specifically be praying for, reach out to us, just shoot us a quick text, shoot us a quick email. And say, Pastor, here's what's going on. Please pray for this. That would help us be able to pray for those things, specifically petition those things on the behalf of you to the Lord. And so I hope that in our first point, the responsibility of the pastor to know the sheep, I hope that gives you a, a basic fundamental understanding of what our calling is in that. It, the next thing I want to look at is our responsibility to feed the sheep. In verse 2, as we've already looked at, Peter says, to shepherd the flock of God that is among you. So if we went back to the introduction to this book, we see that Peter's writing this epistle to the, he's writing it to the churches in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And so here within chapter 5, he's specifically addressing the elders within that group of churches. But I can't help but think that as he's writing this to these elders, he's thinking about the words that he received from the risen Lord, the chief shepherd, that are recorded in John's gospel in John chapter 21. Is when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to me, He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. There's the word that Peter uses, the exact word in 1 Peter chapter 5 that's translated there as shepherd. So he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. So I think what I want us to take away from that text is that a part of what it means to shepherd the lamb, shepherd the flock of God, is to feed them. And also I think what's critically important to see here is what does Jesus ask Peter every time before he gives, this, gives him this exhortation to feed, to shepherd, to feed? He says, do you love me? So this, this call to shepherd, to feed the flock of God has to be rooted and grounded in a love of Christ. That has to be the drive, the motivation, the heart motive here that presses the shepherd forward to do these things. So that brings us to a question, okay, we're to feed the sheep, what are we to feed the sheep? I think if we went around to the average church in the Metroplex this morning or visited the Christian bookstore, we might come away with thinking that pastors are to feed the sheep, maybe some personal anecdotes and stories, maybe some motivational speeches, maybe a checklist of how you can have your best life now. But let's see what we might derive from God's Word about that. If we went to Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, this is one of Jesus' responses to Satan as he's tempted in the wilderness. But he answered, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So what we as shepherds are called to feed God's sheep is His very Word. We see that in Acts chapter 6. 
For this is at the time period where the apostles have come to a point what we would describe as the seven proto-deacons, and they are to be the, those that oversee the serving of tables. And the apostles say that they will devote themselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And so, as pastors or shepherds, we are to feed you, feed the flock, feed the congregation God's word. As a part of this, we're to be faithful in prayer, recognizing that apart from the work of the Spirit of God, through the preaching of the Word of God, to the people of God, if the Spirit doesn't come, no work is going to happen. No change will occur. So we're to be men of prayer, men of the Word. But... That gives us the what, but now, what's the how? How are we as pastors to feed the sheep? I think one of Paul's exhortations to Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, lays this out very concisely and clearly. There he tells Timothy, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. And so in its most simple and basic form, our call is to read the Word, explain the Word, and with exhortation, give application of the Word to the life of the congregation. So read the Word, explain the Word, offer exhortation with application. That is the feeding of the flock in its most basic and concise sense. Practically speaking, how this is worked out is primarily on Sunday mornings, primarily through the pulpit ministry here within the church. And something I think that's very important for us to see and notice and when Jesus speaks, he talks about every word that comes from the mouth of God. And that may bring to mind the text in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, where Paul speaks of all Scripture being theonostos, God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. So we're talking about, as I mentioned earlier, the teaching of all Scripture, the full counsel of God. That's one of the reasons why we typically preach systematically through books of the Bible. Why I just finished up in the book of Judges and, and Jesse's continuing through the Gospel of John. Just systematically, the, 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 the text itself guiding what the points of the sermons are. Not letting our preference or our whims be the, the primary guidance for the word that gets preached. That's also why we preach expositionally. What that basically means is we want the point of the text to be the point of the sermon. We don't want to just you know, take cherry pick a verse out and use that as a, as a diving board basically to jump off into whatever topic or thoughts that we might want to share. We want to take that text, exegete it, pull the meaning out of it, and have that be the point of the message that we preach to you. And notice that I said that the pulpit ministry, the, the Sunday morning ministry is the primary time, but it's not the exclusive time that we are to be feeding the Word. But the fact that makes it the primary time, I hope you understand why Jesse and I speak so often of the importance of fulfilling the command to not neglecting the gathering of the saints. If you see the weightiness of the call of the shepherd, the call of the shepherd to feed the flock, and this being that primary time of being able to feed you, exhort you with the word of God, then for you to neglect that 
we see as shepherds it would be just as detrimental where if a shepherd of the sheep out in the pasture calls and comes it calls the sheep to come but there's a few off there that never come in to eat what's going to happen to those sheep what's their health going to be like and how much more so when the flock of God is not coming and being fed his word and so that's why you'll get a text or a call brother sister you know how are you how are things going it's not in any sense to to lord it over you or you know like like in school you would get a demerit when when you know you don't make it to class on time or not there it's the reality that we are called as soul watchers accountable for your soul seeing our responsibility to know to feed you individually not 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 a corporate calling but each individual member of this church we are called in that way to so there's an urgency in those things and that's why next week we're going to flip this around and look at your obligation to us as pastors and so as I mentioned, Sunday mornings, primary but not the exclusive time of feeding. We see in Acts chapter 5, verse 42, this is right before the text we just read earlier with the appointment of the proto-deacons. It says, And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. In the context there, speaking of the apostles, but we can take that and apply that to the pastor, the shepherd, and that's what faithful pastors and shepherds have done for almost the last 2,000 years, that it's not just a Sunday morning pulpit ministry, but it's a house-to-house, a coming individually to the sheep to teach, to exhort, to encourage them with the Word of God. So we've seen our calling, our duty as pastors to know you, the sheep, to feed you, the sheep. And probably those two things sit pretty well with you when you hear those. Most of us, I think, as Christians, maybe all of us, we want to be known. We want to grow in our understanding of the Word of God. We want to be fed. But this third duty, this third responsibility that I want to speak of that we have as pastors, it, it can maybe ruffle a few feathers. It can make some of you uncomfortable. And it's our duty, our responsibility to, to lead the sheep, to lead the congregation. The reality is that submission to leadership, it's always a struggle. But as I think about our context here within America, I was thinking about even the, the, the Pledge of Allegiance that we probably are all familiar with, where we, we claim to be one nation under God. I mean, there, there's so much of that that's laughable, but what, what I want to, my, my point in that is that that's not, the, the one nation is not how we view ourselves. We view ourselves as individuals under our own autonomous thought. We are the ones that are the boss. We are the ones that get to decide what leaders we will and won't submit to. We've been taught to question leadership pretty much all, for the last 50 years probably most of us here aren't even old enough to remember a time where the fundamental thought of leadership was not to question them and unfortunately once you go away from the standard of God's word you've lost any way to actually question leadership biblically because once again it just goes back to like we saw in the book of Judges everyone doing what's right in his own eyes and then in Texas, it seems that though there is certain more outward trappings of God, I would say we have much more of an independent spirit even than most of the other parts of the country. Even our, our state symbol, the Lone Star, is just a symbol of independence and defiance of authority. Then I think this is further complicated as we look, say, even at the Metroplex where there's literally almost a church on every corner. And 
probably those of you, especially that live in those neighborhoods where that is so much the case, cards all the time of churches trying to, to marketing, market and sell themselves, you know, with the new building, the whatever new program, you know, that's going on. And I think when we're taught to shop for a church like we'd shop for a new car, or we're looking for all the, the bells and whistles, it doesn't really lend itself to pastors there preaching upon things like this, upon the preaching of duties of pastors, responsibilities of church members. Those two things seem mutually exclusive. There's not a lot of selling to the, to the, to the flesh in speaking of those things is, is the reality. And so... I think all of this tends to have us think, well, if I disagree with the leaders in the church, if I disagree with the pastors, well, I can just go right down the road to this other church. You know, maybe they'll scratch my itch where I've got it now. I mean, the reality is, though, that when we do that, what's going to happen is you're going to go down the road in a few years, and there's going to be some other decision, some other point that you disagree with that church. In, and you're going to be back in the very same place. And eventually, if you continue down that road, you're going to have a circle about this big. It's probably just going to have you in it that you actually feel like that you can have fellowship with. And so we see here that the elders are called the shepherd, the flock of God among you, exercising oversight. This basically means to look upon, to inspect, to oversee, to look after, or to care for. So we can see that the elders were called to oversee the affairs of the church. We're called to look after, to care for the affairs of the church and the people of God. We see Paul, once again, in his letter to Timothy, says, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. And so the elders are to oversee, the elders are to rule, and to get a little bit better understanding of what Paul is speaking of here when he says the elders who rule, the ones who rule well, the word there in the Greek is actually used by, the by Paul in the qualifications for elder two chapters earlier in 1 Timothy chapter 3 where he speaks of the elder needing to manage the same word, his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church. So basically we see that the elders are called to oversee, to rule, to manage the flock of God that's among them in the same way that they as Christian husbands and fathers are called to oversee, to manage, to rule their own household. Let's talk about how the elders are to lead. What is this overseeing? What is this managing? What is this ruling to look like? First, I want to look at the three knots that we see within verses 2 and 3. Peter says, not under compulsion, not for shameful gain, and not domineering over those in your charge. So first, not under compulsion. This is a man who is not forced into this office as pastor by circumstances or by the people around him. And not for shameful gain. So these are the pastors are not those who pastor for the power, pastor for financial gain. And they're not domineering over those that are in their charge. So it's not a man, it's not men that are anxious to dominate, anxious to, to rule over the flock of God that's among them. 
These are men that recognize that while they have been called to the office of shepherd, they're also one of the sheep. Now, two of the positive counters to those negatives, but willingly and but eagerly. So these are men that, that take on this weighty responsibility with eagerness. They recognize the weight of the calling, but because God is the one who has placed that calling upon them, they're unable to do anything else. These are servant leaders. I love this text in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 7, where here, here Paul is describing how he and those with him acted amongst the church in Thessalonica. He says, But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. I think that just so perfectly paints the heart that the pastor needs to have, to be gentle, affectionately desirous of the flock, sharing not only the gospel, but their own selves. The flock has become so dear to them. So we have pastors not shepherding for their own well-being, but so affectionate of the flock that they're seeking the well-being of the flock, even at their own expense. It truly is an example of Christ who came to serve, not to be served, but to give his life as a ransom for many. That is the call of the pastor. And once again, I'm just struck at just the, the two offices in the church that we have. We have the pastor and the deacon, the shepherd and the servant. This is leadership in God's view. As I mentioned, yes, pastors are to lead, but this leadership flows out of love. This love of God, this love of Christ that we saw with Christ's exhortation to Peter, which overflows into a love of the congregation. So truly, it is a, it is a supernatural work within the heart of a man to desire, to aspire, to shepherd the flock of God. And the third counter to the knot is but being examples to the flock. And I, as I was thinking, okay, how would I summarize what we're called to, to be examples to the flock. Well, the best place I could think of was to go to the qualifications for elder that we see in Titus chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. And here Paul is telling Titus, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained in order and appoint elders, again, there's plural, in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, there's our word again, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he might be able to give instruction in sound doctrine, and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So if I were to take all of that and summarize it in just a few points, I would say that a pastor is called to be above reproach. A pastor is called to be faithful, called to be an example in his Christian character. He's called to be above reproach, faithful, an example in his relationship with his wife and his children. And he's called to be faithful, above reproach, and an example in holding and teaching to sound doctrine. Truly, as elders, as pastors, we should be able to say, as Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. 
not saying that we can do those things perfectly. I, I can just assure you very far from it. But we are to demonstrate Christ's likeness as a, a style, as a direction of our lives. In not if, but when we fail in that, we're to be examples in coming, confessing, seeking reconciliation, in putting sin to death by the power of the Spirit. The call is examples in all of those things. And so that gives us a, a summary of what it means to lead the sheep. So we're to know, we're to feed, we're to lead. And then lastly, the fourth point we're going to look at is our calling to protect the sheep. This duty is implied within the call to shepherd the flock of God, and it's more explicitly laid out elsewhere. In Acts chapter 20, verses 28 and 32, I think is a great example of that. We're here once again, Paul is exhorting the Ephesian elders. He says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. So here we have this exhortation that we've already looked at by Paul. He says, pay careful attention to yourselves, to all the flocks, or each and every one of the flock. We're to take heed to, pay attention to, care for. And he warns them that even from within the elders there, within that church at Ephesus, there's going to be false teachers that arise, that come up seeking to draw the brothers and sisters after themselves. And certainly that will result in division in the church or even a splitting of the church. That brings us to a question. Well, what does a wolf look like? How are we going to know to, to recognize what a wolf is? Well, the reality, brothers and sisters, is they're going to look just like a sheep. They're going to look just like a Jackson or a Will or a Moss. They're going to look like a Corey or a Chris. They're going to look like a sheep. That's what makes them so dangerous. But Jesus in Matthew, in, in Matthew chapter 7 says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So that's why in our text in Acts chapter 20 that we just looked at in verse 32, there Paul tells the Ephesian elders to be alert. Be alert, you'll recognize them by their fruits. These men are slick, these men are deceptive, they're deceitful, they're going to look like the sheep, but you'll know them by their fruits. Titus chapter 1, verse 9. And the qualifications for elder that we looked at there, Paul says he must hold, fat, hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he might be able to give instruction and sound doctrine and also be able to rebuke those who contradict it. So the reality is that there's going to be times in the church where Jesse and I and whatever other pastors the Lord might raise up here are going to have to stand up and rebuke, going to have to stand up and refute false doctrine. Maybe it's privately, maybe it's in a group, maybe it's before the congregation, but that is part of our duty, part of our calling. 
as I was thinking about that, I, it occurred to me just how much easier it is today than probably ever before in history for false teaching to come in. I was thinking about, well, what, what would that look like in the time of the New Testament, in the time of these Ephesian elders? Well, you'd have, probably have to have some false teacher physically come in and begin to teach these things. Whereas now, I looked in on, on Sermon Audio right now, there's 1.3 million sermons available there to listen to. On Kindle, there's over 3.5 million books. So you could download a sermon, you could download a book in, I mean, in a matter of seconds and be exposed to all sorts of false teaching and heresy. And so it, it just points to the increasing urgency of Jesse and I and the call to be able to shepherd the flock to be diligent, vigilant in watching these doctrines that come and creep into the church. It also reminded me of the importance of helping the congregation to see how do we handle those different levels of doctrine? How do, we, how do we know the difference between something that's a heresy, or maybe scripture would even say is a damnable heresy. If you believe this thing, it would seem that you're not saved. Or something over here that's a matter of Christian liberty. How do we determine the difference between those things? We spent a few months earlier this year, I believe it was, that walking through these things in the men's meeting, and that's something something that Jesse's going to preach on here in the coming month or two. So I hope that that helps you to see a broad overview, a broad summary of what our calling is as pastors. This calling to know the sheep, this calling to feed the sheep, this calling to lead, and this calling to protect. But what's the end of all that? What was the, why are pastors called to those things? Like, I can think of one verse that summarizes so well the, the prayer of Jesse in my heart in this. It's Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. Where Paul says, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. That is our hope, that is our prayer, that everyone that's among this flock of God that he's entrusted us with would be in Christ, would be surely and soundly saved, that wouldn't be one of those that on the last day is spoken of in Matthew chapter 7 that comes and says, Lord, Lord, and he says, depart from me, I never knew you you workers of iniquity. As Brother Jack spoke of in the five solas class this morning on faith alone, that we, we see in Scripture there's, we see dead faith, we see false faith, we see all these different kinds of faith, we see demonic faith. James says even the demons believe and they shudder. So our hope and our prayer, what we're striving for is that that would not be anyone here that we are called to be soul watchers over. And there within that text in Colossians 1.20, it says that we may present everyone mature in Christ. So that is our hope and prayer that everyone that we've been given responsibility for would be growing in Christ's likeness. Not that there aren't struggles, not that there aren't trials and ups and downs, but as a direction, as a style of life, there would be a growing conformity to the image of Christ within the life of everyone here. And so maybe you're thinking, okay, pastor, those are really great reminders and exhortations to you and Jesse. Now get to work. Go do those things. And I think that 
there's a sense that that's a, that's a good application for us. I, as I mentioned, these were, in going through and studying this week, those were just very humbling and convicting things. But I want to give you some takeaways as the congregation, as the, the church members. Okay, now, what do we, how do we do? How do we apply this as we go away from here? Well, first... Continue to pray for Jesse and I as we seek to know and feed and lead and protect the flock well to the glory of God. Continue to pray for the Lord to raise up more men to come alongside us and to shepherd you. And I hope that this word today gives more clarity to what kind of men you should be praying for the Lord to raise up. As I was thinking about this, if you're a man sitting here today, apart from a work of God in your heart, I think the first thought is to be like Jonah, to run as far away from these callings that you hear as you could possibly get. But if as you sit here, you see this work of God beginning in your heart, that instead of running, which seems the natural response, that you actually, as Paul says, you actually aspire to this office, which is a noble thing. Then come talk to Jesse and I about that. Come talk to us about, okay, how do you assess this aspiration, this calling in your life? What does the preparation for that begin to look like? I pray even for some of the young boys, the young men here, that the Lord would, would spark that desire within their hearts even now. They may not pastor for 20 years from now, but even now the Lord would begin this work, this desire with in their own hearts. Then, fourthly, as you see men within this congregation that seem to meet the qualifications for elder that you see in 1 Timothy 3 and in Titus chapter 1, and you see them beginning to fulfill these responsibilities that we've just walked through, these responsibilities to know, to feed, to lead, to protect this flock, come talk to Jesse and I about that. The reality is that, that there's just two of us. We can't be everywhere and see everything. So as men begin to rise up and demonstrate this calling in their lives, that's something pastorally that we're called to shepherd these gifts, not just the gift of pastoring, but teaching and, and serving all the gifts within the, within the church. That's part of our duty and responsibility is to shepherd those gifts. And then the last application, the last takeaway I want to leave you with is as you think about those duties that I just laid out, Next week, what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip the tables. I'm going to talk about the duties of you, the congregation, to us as pastors. And it's going to be in light of what we just talked about. So I think it would be very helpful even over this week before we get to those to think and pray and meditate. Okay, here's what my pastors are called to on my behalf what biblically should my response be then to them in light of that, in light of the things that we looked at today? And so th those points will be on the, the take home. And so if, you, if you're not on the email list, make sure you get that. And I just want to encourage you to be thinking, to be praying, to be meditating upon those things that we talked about. Let's go before the Lord and ask for his help. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you in the name of Christ, the chief shepherd, the one mediator between God and man. Lord, we recognize that it's only in his name, only through his shed blood that we can come and approach your throne of grace. Lord, I pray that you would bring the increase from the word that was preached today. 
Lord, I pray for Jesse and I that we would, by your grace, be able to, to know, to feed, to lead, to protect well. Lord, that we would, in a, as a part of that, that we would decrease and that you would increase, that you would be given all the glory from all the pastoring, all the shepherding that goes on here. And Lord, I do pray that you would work in the hearts of the men here, that you would call to this office, that you would, Lord, help them to see the true nature of it. Lord, and just despite how humbling and terrifying it is that they would see that because it's a call that you have placed in their life that they can do nothing else. Lord, be faithful in, in raising men up to shepherd, to serve this flock. And it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.